We want to create value first and think about revenue and, and money and the ROI. That's a byproduct. Hey, podcast listener, you're about to discover insider tips, tricks, and secrets to making more sales and converting more prospects into customers with email marketing. For more information about the email marketing podcast or the autoresponder guide, go to dropdeadcopy.com slash podcast. Hey, uh, it's John at McIntyre here, the autoresponder guy, and it's time for episode 57 of the McMethod Email Marketing Podcast, where you'll discover tactics and strategies to increase your email profits by 25 to 100% in 90 days or less without spending more on advertising. Basically, that boils down to uh, you listen to this podcast, you're going to make more money with email. It's that simple. Okay, I've got to make this whole thing simpler. Now, today, I'll be talking to Nick Francis. Nick is the co-founder of Help Scout. Help Scout is a little piece of software that's a SaaS company. It's a software as a service that lets you manage your relationships with your customers. It's a customer support app, and uh, they're doing some really cool stuff. Now, the reason I got him on today, as you'll hear in a minute, is because he's uh, he's got a bit of a controversial opinion, or at least in these parts on this podcast, that marketing that you can't always sometimes you can't tie marketing to ROI. This is things like guest posts, content marketing, customer support, branding. You can't always tie it to ROI. And sometimes on this podcast, I've had guests who make fun of this, and right? you make fun of branding and all this kind of stuff. And uh, in some ways, they're right. It, it, it's not not that ROI is the business and it's not that it's not the business, it's that that's just not the full picture and that's what Nick's here to talk about, that brand support and marketing value without, are still valuable even if you can't connect the dots to ROI, okay? We know it works, this is what Nick was saying, that's where the magic happens and that's where a lot of competitors aren't actually doing anything interesting. So Nick's got some really interesting stuff to share. It's not specifically about email so much as it is is about, uh, you could sum this up as, it's about how to create an amazing experience for your customers so they just keep buying your stuff stuff, right? It's not, you can't directly tie it to ROI, but you can make a lot more money this way. It just takes a lot of effort. To get the show notes for this episode of the Email Marketing Podcast, go to themcmethod.com slash five seven. Now, I've got one McMaster's Insight of the week this week. McMaster's, if you don't know, is my private community. In that community, you ha- you get access to the Mac and Time Method, stories that sell, pages that convert, basically a bunch of training products that will take you from not knowing anything about email marketing and, and building a sales funnel to knowing enough to start converting uh, your email leads into customers. Sometimes it sounds overwhelming and difficult and frustrating. It's not that hard. Right? I've had people email me after just listening to this podcast. One guy recently, a couple of weeks back, $85,000 or to be more specific, I think it was eighty four thousand dollars two hundred eighty one, eighty four thousand two hundred eighty one dollars, and uh, that was just from the podcast, right? So you're gonna get way more than you get at the podcast, and you get all the other stuff too when you join McMaster's. But enough of that. Today, this week's insight was uh, about recurring revenue. Now, I started a thread there a couple months back when I was talking about why recurring revenue is, you know, it's really cool because people sign up and they're giving you money every single month and that's just great because, you know, if after 12 months, if you charge 100 bucks a month, you can make $1,200 for them. It's crazy, but that's not how it works, right? Because every community, every SaaS product, every recurring billing service has a lifetime. You're going to have an average lifetime value of a customer, which maybe it's three months. So therefore, you've got a $300 average lifetime value per customer. Of course, some people will stay 12 months, but most people won't in this case. Okay, so what you have is not that it's not that the recurring revenue is the greatest thing in the world. It's that your lifetime value has just jumped from whatever it was before, which might have been a hundred dollars, to now three hundred. Okay, so recurring revenue is not like I said. It's not the end. It's not just the greatest thing ever. All it is is a is a way of structuring your business to ma- to bump your lifetime value, lifetime customer value up. Okay, now that's where it's important. Okay, so recurring revenue. It's, it's, cr- it's all it's cracked up to be, but there's something that's more important, right? There's a, a metric that you should be focusing on. I've mentioned it a few times, lifetime and customer value. Instead of thinking about, well, I should launch a forum or I should start charging, you know, five bucks a month for something or a hundred bucks a month or a thousand bucks a month, whatever it happens to be, start thinking, how can you create a high lifetime value? How can you create products and services? How can you create things for your customers and for your market that's going to allow you to sell more of your stuff to them, which is going to bump your lifetime value up? Let's say you may currently make $100 per customer right now. In six months' time, imagine you've done some tweaking. You know, you've done your sales funnel, you've improved some products, you've created some new offers, and now your lifetime value has jumped to $200. That means if you were getting 10 customers a month, you're making $1,000 a month, and now you're making $2,000 a month. You just doubled your business by making some small tweaks, okay? Whether that's with a recurring revenue thing or a, uh, or a non-recurring revenue thing by just uh, creating more offers, more upsells, and things like that. So the, the, the light bulb moment for me in there was that recurring revenue is not the business. It's not the savior to your business, right? 
And people with forums is great, but forums come with their own set of problems. That's a whole new thing to talk about. But the whole idea here is the insight of the week from McMaster's is go recurring revenue, but don't focus on that. Specifically, focus on bumping your lifetime customer value as high as freaking possible, okay? If you want to hear more about McMaster's or get more insights like this, go to themcmethod.com slash McMaster's. Now, I've got one listener question, and then we'll get into this podcast with Nick Francis. The question is, what is your advice for marketing to people who potentially live in poor areas? I think this is a great question because this, uh, a lot of people might look at this question and think, well, that's kind of like, that is really hard. It's so difficult, you know? People, these people don't have any money, you know, they're, they're living a tough life. You know, things are hard. But here's the interesting thing, and I, and I don't mean to make fun of poor people. I'm not, I'm not even making fun of them. But if you look at, I used to work in a supermarket, like, you know, way back in the day when I just left school, I worked as a cashier in a supermarket. And it's interesting, you know, at times we're selling cigarettes and alcohol, and it was interesting noticing the sort of people that come through there, right? You'd have people come through, and they're obviously poor, like they're terribly dressed. Sometimes they smell, they obviously don't have much money. They, they, whether they're, it's, you know, you know it through a conversation having with someone, they just seem stressed out. You can tell they're poor, yet they're coming in and they're buying alcohol and cigarettes. So what's happening there is it's not that you should go out and sell alcohol and cigarettes. It's that you have to understand that poor people have money too. And they, will, they, they are just as likely to spend the money on the things that they want as anyone else. They might not have as much disposable money in the sense that you don't want to go and try to sell Ferraris to poor people. That's you're just not going to get anywhere. They have to have the, enough money to buy it. But the point here is, is that poor people still buy stuff. Right? It doesn't matter who they are, whether it's alcohol, cigarettes, or a weight loss diet guide, or a personal training thing, or a plumbers to fix their, whatever it happens to be. Right? So as for what is, you know, so what's my advice for marketing this world? To understand that they have needs, they have problems, they have, th- they have reasons that they're going to buy stuff. And so your goal as the marketer is to, f- is to understand what those reasons are, and then use those reasons to persuade these potentially poor people, or people who potentially live in poor areas, persuade those people to buy your products and buy your services, okay? So it, it all comes back to empathy. Whether they're poor or rich, just go and understand. Who are they? What do they do? What are their problems? What do they care about? What's keeping them up at night? What sort of budget do they have? All this sort of stuff. And then just find the perfect person to sell, you, to sell your products and services to you, whether it's a poor person or a rich person, okay? I hope that makes sense. Now let's go get into this podcast. It's going to be a fun one with Mr. Nick Francis. It's John McIntyre here, the autoresponder guy. I'm here with Nick Francis. Now, Nick is the co-founder of Help Scout. Help Scout is uh, some nifty help desk software, which uh, builds itself as a very, very simple piece of software that allows you to connect with your customers. Um, so here we go, simple, straightforward way to provide excellent support. What I brought him on the show today to talk about is I heard about him through Tim, who uh, does the Lead Pages conversion cast or the conversion podcast. And uh, we started chatting via email. And one thing that that Nick mentioned is that uh, he's all about you know doing things like uh, marketing and support and not necessarily being able to connect them to ROI. So on this show, we've talked before about uh, say doing advertising and, and doing sorts of marketing and you always want to be able to tie that to ROI so you know if it's successful or not. That's a great strategy but what, what I thought what would be cool to get Nick on the show is, is he has kind of like a, the opposite, well not the opposite, but he's uh, very much about doing things like I think it's content marketing support, stuff where you can't connect you can't always connect it to the ROI, but it's still very, very important. So that's what we're going to talk about in just a minute. Nick, how are you going today? Great. Thanks for having me, John. Thanks for coming on. So uh, before we get into this, the topic for today, give us, uh, give us like a quick little background on uh, a bit more about you and uh, what you're up to with HelpScout. Sure. So I've never had a real job in life. I've always felt like I've, I'm have i an entrepreneur. Uh, and so at, right out of college, I started a design consultancy with uh, two of my best friends. And uh, we went around that for about six years, always wanted to build web apps. And so uh, we finally did. We built a couple of web apps, but Help Scout was really the one that stuck. Uh, basically, we started in Nashville, Tennessee, now live in Boston. We went through Techstars Startup Accelerator. That's how we got to Boston. And that was about three years ago when we launched Help Scout. And the business is growing like crazy, and we're having a lot of fun. And uh, yeah, that's about it till now. Cool, man. Cool, man. Well, let's talk about this marketing stuff that we, uh, like I said, we, we started yeah. to have our email. You talked about brand support and marketing value is extremely important, but you can't always clearly connect the dots to ROI. And uh, sure. so you're saying your take is that there's a lot of successful marketing, you can't directly tie it to it, but tie it to ROI, but we know it works. And you even said that that's where the magic happens. Now, this is like sure. I said, it's, it's a little bit of a controversial opinion, um, <laughs> or at least around, you know, at least on this podcast, because usually it's, sure. it's always about direct response and copywriting. So tell me about this. Let's kind of like map out the topic as a whole, and then we'll dive in somewhere where it uh, makes sense. So give me like a big, broad overview 
of uh, sure. what your summary is of it. Yeah, I mean, to preface, I mean, I'm as big a fan of, of data as any other guy. But at the same time, I believe that directly correlating a marketing effort to ROI is a very small part of the big picture. So if you're somebody that's trying to grow a business directly on channels where you can easily see, you know, $3 of ROI for every $1 that you spend, I think you're missing out on a, a massive opportunity through all sorts of other channels. That's all. Okay. So and what did you mean by that? You said here that like that's where the magic happens. So it sounds like that this sure. is just about finding something that's kind of cool. This is about finding like this sort of stuff if you pay attention to it. And I mentioned this podcast in the sense that up until now, which will change very soon, I'm about to launch some paid traffic stuff. But up until now, I've done more or less content marketing with the podcast and some blog posts. And it has worked going on other people's podcasts as well. It's, it's worked extremely well. And no, I, there's no way I can tie that to ROI in any sort of direct way. I could have a rough correlation. But I can't mm-hmm. tie it to this. And, and to me, like this podcast, for example, like it's, it's completely done magic for me. But what, I mean, what did you mean by that? What sort of magic happens when you start focusing on this stuff? I think that's a great example, John, but there's there's several ways that you can create a magical experience for a customer, and I don't necessarily think the way that you initially get them to your website is a magical experience for them. It's what happens afterwards. It's how they interact with your brand, how they interact with your support team and your product, what the user experience is like. When you think about your favorite products or your favorite companies or experiences, you think about the magic. You don't think about the way with which they went about acquiring you as a customer, right? That doesn't matter to you. Where the magic happens is, is in the content or the, the product experience. Absolutely. I mean, there's things where I've found, like, like Apple's a great example. Everyone always uses Apple as an example. But right, yeah. You pick up one of their devices. I'm on a, you know, a Mac right now. I've got an iPhone next to me. And this stuff, it just works. I mean, that's the... I don't even know how else to describe it. It just works. It almost never screws up, and it does it in such a simple, elegant way that's sure. probably extremely hard to create, which is why you know Apple's been so successful. But, and do you uh, think there's guys at Apple sitting with spreadsheets trying to correlate the uh, user experience and all the money that they're putting into design of their products and correlating that to ROI? Heck no. <laughs> yeah, Diana, that's a great point. So the interesting thing is, well, the, the best question to ask here is like, how do you start to develop this? Is when it's like, we're talking about ROI and paid advertising and, and you know, buying lists or any of these kind of, you know, paid ads basically or paid marketing. It, mm-hmm. You're going to have an ROI. You can say, we spent this and we made this. So when you're starting mm-hmm. to look through a different lens, and this is, I guess, just a different perspective or a different pair of glasses you can put on to look at the, the lay of the land, how do you... How do you do it in the way, like, like, what are some strategies that can kind of do it in a way that really works? Well, I think it all starts with what is the, what's the mission of your business? You know, when you go out and you start a company, what is the mission? What are you trying to accomplish? And for us, it was not to make as much money as possible. If that is the goal, I believe that I, I'm probably not the right guy uh, to talk to about business. But for us, the mission is to help you build a company that people love. And very little of that is about money more you know revenue for our business is more a byproduct of getting the other things right and so when you think about business in that context it really changes the game for you and it helps you say well hey if i'm if i exist to help people build a company that other that their customers are going to love then shoot i need to invest in some really great content to help these people and create value you know i was reading on your website john and and you completely understand the idea of of creating empathy and and that's where great copy comes from right understanding your customers is where great copy comes from and that's the only way that you can go about creating massive value for them and so that's really our approach when it comes to help scout we want to create value first and think about revenue and, and money and the roi that's a byproduct if we get the value right and we get the mission right then people are going to use our product I like this idea. It actually creates, it's almost like it starts triggering a new set of questions. I mean, you can look through a business saying, well, what are we spending on marketing? What are we making on it? How can we tweak it so we spend less and make more? And so it's you looking at conversion elements and all ways to kind of eke out more and more and more things. And often these things won't actually make the experience or make the, the customer's world or make the product or any of these things actually better to the end user. They're ways to almost like, it's important to be sure, but it's like hacking a system. You're just trying to like little twists and turns. You know, you're twisting the knobs. You're like a mad scientist in a little, uh, you know, underground lab somewhere doing some cool mm-hmm. stuff. But you're not mm-hmm. actually, this is a different question. You're not actually saying, well, how can we help these people more? It's just how can we make more money? You know, what's the best way to do this? Which leads you down a different road. But what you're yep. saying is kind of instead of saying how can we make more money, it's more about uh, 
how can we delight these people? How can we make them go, whoa, this company is insane? Mm-hmm. And, I, and I think it's, you know, a lot of times though you can get the same result. So, for instance, um, you know, on Tim's podcast, which you mentioned, we talked about onboarding and how we use email for onboarding. To me, when we think about email onboarding and getting people to use the product, that's a twofold benefit, right? So we're helping, we're trying to delight customers with our product and our experience. But at the same time, when we increase conversion from that, that also results in revenue for the business. So it's it, it's not as though I'm uh, all rainbows and unicorns over here. I totally understand connecting the dots to revenue and being able to measure everything you can. But a lot of times when you start with, hey, can I create a delightful experience? The end game is better conversion and more money, right? Right, right. And so you mentioned, I, mean, I think we talked about this before the call, you're in the SaaS business. So what you have sure. is you're basically making a sale in a sense. You're making a sale every single month. So it's, it's in, a, in a case like that when you're doing a recurring billing, whether it's SaaS or it's a membership community or anything where someone's paying every month, is that it's, you basically have to keep making that sale every month. And if they could find the same value, if the, the person signing up to your service can find the same value elsewhere for less than what you charge for it, because you aren't putting enough effort into the lighting of the customer, they're going to go elsewhere eventually. Yeah, and that's the interesting thing about SaaS. It's, it's, uh, I call it long ball, right? Like mm. we're, we're really playing, all of our marketing efforts are for the long term. There's nothing short term marketing wise that's really going to help our business because it's not uncommon for a SaaS company, their cost of acquisition to, they don't recoup that for at least six months a lot of times. Mm. Uh, ours is a little bit different. We recoup ours in the first month, but for most SaaS companies, it's not crazy for it to take six months to recoup your costs. And so for six months, this customer has to have such a delightful experience that they pay you six separate times <laughs> and say, this is worth my money. And uh, being able to create that kind of value for a year, two years, three years and on, uh, it just takes a very different perspective. Okay. I'm curious here how we do, like, let's run through some examples because I want to try and like, see if we can sure. produce some sort of actionable, um, I don't know you call it, kind of like, look at some actions, action items, that's what they're called. Absolutely. So let's, th- so let's think, let's say you're a, uh, like today, we're at, at a roundtable call with uh, the community that I run and uh, the one of the girls in there, we, we reviewed her email and she's a, uh, she does boot camps, so fitness boot camps. So I, mm-hmm. I, I suppose men and women would go to her and they'd go off into the park or on the beach or somewhere like that and they'd, they'd have a boot camp. Mm-hmm. Right, so and, and I think uh, from what I remember, I think the product was a hundred dollars or two hundred dollars a month or something like that. Maybe it's in a warehouse or something like that. So it is a recurring product, but it's a little bit That's different great. to SaaS. So in a situation like this, how would you go about creating an incredible customer experience without relating it directly to ROI? Mm-hmm. You know, as as I think that that you would, the, I would take the same approach as you would. I would start with extraordinary empathy. And trying to understand, really get it inside the head of my personas. And who is my ideal customer? Um, are there three different kinds of cu- customers? We call them personas at Help Scout. Uh, and really try to deeply understand what drives them, what motivates them, what they end up struggling with, you know, why they fall off the wagon. And until I can finish their sentences, I don't feel like I have enough empathy. I don't have a great enough understanding about what they're looking for. So it really ha- everything has to start from there. And then I would try to think about, okay, what does it mean for me to create value for them? You know, for them, it may not be guest posting and creating uh, free resources for them to download and use in their business, right? It's going to be a very different approach than what we use at Help Scout. But it's um, similar in that you're thinking about how can I create extraordinary value for them? Is it, you know, how can I incentivize them to want to do business with me for a long time? And I'm not an expert on fitness boot camps, but I think we could get pretty far just by deeply understanding the customer and starting to ask some of those questions. Mm, absolutely. I mean, we were talking about that today, this morning, when uh, you know, I was saying, you know, get on the phone with these people and you find out, like, wh- wh- what are their main issues here? Why are they coming to these boot camps and why aren't they coming? You know, because mm-hmm. you, you had a customer reactivation email, so she wanted to kind of get some feedback on that email. But the idea was that these people have canceled. So what would be really interesting was going to these people and finding out why they canceled, because then you'd have, have a list of ideas to go through and basically improve this customer experience and create a whole new thing. And I would think a lot of the reason people fall off the wagon, I'd have to understand this, but I, I would think, based on my own fitness track record, <laughs> that you know you, people just don't have time, right? They kind of, or they pretend they don't have time at least, uh, and they fall off the wagon. It might be laziness. It could be any one of uh, those things. So maybe 
maybe they aren't understanding the goal clearly enough. You know, clearly uh, this is just not a big enough priority. So is there a way for you can, is there a way that you can create um, this goal for them and really try to incentivize meeting that goal? Okay. I think another, another one example I just thought of then is I recently ordered something from, uh, who was it? What's his name? Uh, anyway, I'm going to get pick it up right now because this is a great example. It's called uh, 108 Proven Split Test Winners. From, uh, hmm. It's from Dotcom Secrets, which is Russell Brunson's company. Um, mm-hmm. Brunson's got a bit of a, depending on who you talk to, some people love him, some people hate him and think he's terrible. But anyway, so I got this, I got this little magazine, right? It's this uh, basically an ebook. Some people might show me an ad on Facebook saying, so, you know, I've got this, check out this split test, you know, I'll save this ebook for $97. I think this was, I don't know what I paid, I think it was shipping and handling, $5. And uh, it's obviously a marketing thing to get me into a sales funnel, but it's $5. <laughs> and this thing is, is, I mean, it's high quality, glossy paper, and they've sent it to me. It's not an ebook, they've sent it to me out here in Thailand. It's full color, glossy paper. And it's just a, I mean, the, the design and everything, it's just a fantastic book. There's so much value in this in terms of, so I can go back to my, and this is very ROI driven in terms of conversion testing. But the idea of, you know, they could have just, they could have sold this for, you know, a dollar and just given me an ebook, or they could have sent something that was just a, a plain PDF thing that would have done the same thing. But I know for a fact, I spoke to my friend today. He was at, he's at, works at the, a co-working space in Sydney and he bought this same book a couple of weeks ago and he said it's just been sitting on his desk at this office and I think at least five people have picked it up flicked through it and then gone and ordered their own copy and mm. you can't track that there's no way that, that Russell Brunson and his team are sitting at a you know in their lab think alright well that guy in Sydney right there he just he just gave us five customers because they saw his uh, magazine I have no idea what's going on there but because they created this product that it's kind of like whoa like the they went to that much effort. That's kind of weird, and it doesn't even cost you. You know, you pay five bucks for it, and uh, he sent it out. So this is the kind of thing that, that that's how he's applying it, and uh, and that's information marketing. So that's kind of more the classic make money online or the classic internet marketing style stuff where it still applies. That's a great example, John, for two reasons. You know, one, you look at that project in a spreadsheet and you're like, what the hell is he doing? I'm sure the cost on that book is well over what it costs for him, uh, is well more than what he made from you, right? Like the, the shipping and handling charge. So we know that he's losing money on this. So what is he trying to create uh, by doing that? Well, one, I think the way that you talked about the book and the quality and everything that you're able to flip through, um, he built trust with you. You can't really buy trust, right? Trust is a is a brand thing, and that's one of those magic factors I talk about. And so when when you can't really, even though that you paid five dollar, even though you paid five dollars for it, he has to put in a lot of time and effort and uh, sweat in order to gain your trust. But he's done that, right? Right. And then there's the whole word of mouth component, which is fantastic. You know that that all of us can understand. Yeah. 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 And then interestingly, it's almost like it always, like, you know, ROI leads you to a customer experience because it's like we're, gonna, we're not going to have the best ROI unless we create a fantastic product. But we're not always going to tie that to ROI. Once you do that for long enough, it's going to lead you back to ROI in the end. So what's happening with this book yep. right here is this guy, Russell, he's probably got either they're in the process of calculating it right now or he knows it down to a T already, which is his uh, customer lifetime value. And each step within that sales funnel, because the sales funnel is going to be by the split test book. And once I've done that, I go into an autoresponder sequence for several other products and I think there was a couple upsells when I bought this anyway that I didn't take at the time but a certain percentage will always take those upsells so he already has an idea of what he's making on what's called the front end of his sales funnel and then on the back end there's other products you can buy so he, he knows or eventually he'll know that on average a person will spend $1,200 with him so he can go and spend let's say this book cost him $20 and I paid $5 for it so he spent at least $15 on this book to send this book out to me but if, he, if he's making $1,200 per person uh, per customer then he can say spend $15 on each person who buys this book and then you can go spend another $50 per uh, well you could spend it in a sense you could spend $200 on going and getting all these people at the page to get this to buy this book but this book in, increases the conversion rate in a very indirect way so it's kind of they mm-hmm. feed into each other they split up and then they feed back into each other it's very interesting and and Russell's a, a great marketer right like he's he's doing this math that you're doing he's he's understanding conversion and he's understanding the ROI for his business the difference is that 
he didn't start this project with ROI in mind. Because if you start a project with ROI in mind, the only incentive is to make it as cheaply as possible and maximize your revenues, mm. right? That, that's not his goal. He would much rather build trust because he knows that ROI is off the charts and that nobody else is going to uh, go as far as he does if, if I say, hey, my goal is to make the product great. And I know the ROI is going to be there on the back end, and I'm going to measure that. That's all good. But to start by saying, how do I maximize my ROI with this product? There's no way you can get to great when you start with ROI. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. I think the, the reason why it's a tough pill to swallow, I think, in a lot of cases, is it's a lot easier to just you know set up your website, drive some traffic to it, maybe run a couple tests, and yeah, you make some money. Maybe you even like you know make you know be profitable and maybe have a good campaign running. But when it comes to like creating an incredible product, like with not just you know great content, like say I have a course right now that's uh, called the McIntyre method. It's sort of phased out. It's still it's still around, but. Uh, that was, I've made it fairly quickly and it's good, it works. People do get a lot out of it. But since then, and the like, I made this a year ago, since then I've had so many different ideas out ways I could just blow that out, blow that whole thing out of the water. I haven't done it yet. Mm. Plan would be to mm-hmm. do it later this year. But the, probably the main reason why I haven't done it yet is it's a lot of effort. All the ideas I've come up with, they're great ideas, but it's not something that I can rush through or do it really quickly. This is something that will have to take time and, and you know, it'll take a lot of time and effort. More like a craftsman approach than about just trying to get it out as fast as possible. So it's sure. I think that's why it's hard, and this is why a lot of people would rather focus just on the ROIs because it's. And like I said, I mean, this is this is what I did a year ago. I was like, I'm going to make this product, and I'm going to get it done as fast as possible because I just want this product. And there's a time and a place for that, but eventually, if you want to get grow, I guess a proper business, a serious business mm-hmm. with some serious numbers, you're going to need to take the product creation, which is the the value delivery mechanism. You got to take that seriously, but that takes time and effort and money. So. Sure. And you touched on an interesting thing there. You said it's easier. Absolutely. (laughs) Absolutely. It's easier to start with with ROI and try to maximize revenues from there. But here's the thing that another thing that we haven't talked about is what if you're in a crowded space? You know, I mean, it's no secret that Help Scout exists in a pretty crowded uh, world of help desk software, right? Mm. There's a lot of really excellent companies out there and um, frankly with much, much deeper pockets than we have. So there's no way for a company like Help Scout to build a great brand and earn a lot of customers and all this other stuff unless we're creative, unless we really think, how can we make this great when it comes to content marketing, when it comes to product experience, when the whole thing, we have to think creatively because everything else has been done. Mm. We have to say, unless we can make it great, it's just not going to work. There's 50 other guys uh, that are already there and they're, and they're plenty good enough. Does that make sense? Oh, absolutely. This, this just reminded me of the whole, the idea of a USP or, or a unique selling proposition where there might be 50 other companies out there. Well, in that case, well, why, should, why should I go to Help Scout or why should anyone go to Help Scout? So what you end up with is a marketing issue where you have to develop a reason for people to do business with you and not anyone else. And ideally, sure. that USP or that, that reason uh, for them to do business with you is, ideally, it's quite hard for someone else to copy. And why I've done it with, with myself. Absolutely is I've kind of branded or positioned myself as what's called the autoresponder guy. So I tend to focus mainly on email marketing and autoresponders as a way to differentiate myself from all the other, say, copywriters out there. Because I know that, say, if, if I've got a friend who's at, say, a seminar and someone comes up to me and goes, you know, I'm, I've got some email marketing stuff I need done. Do you know any copywriters? You're like, oh, it's you to meet John. He's the autoresponder guy. That's all he does. And even if I'm not better than the other copywriters he could recommend, it's easier for him to recommend me because I, there's, a, there's a very clear... Um, idea or a clear atmosphere around what I do. I've made it very simple for people to pass on that message. And the easier that is for people to get, then they're more likely to come around. So that full circle again, you know, that's kind of on the front end of why would people go to you instead of anyone else? And you can't really trace that to ROI in a direct way. Right. And when you make it great, some of those magic factors start to start to materialize, such as building trust. You know, once we've created a lot of value for a customer and we've earned their trust, there's just, it's not a consideration to use another product, even if uh, they may be somewhat incentivized to do so, because uh, we've built a relationship over time. And that's the kind of stuff uh, that you really just can't measure in a spreadsheet, no matter how hard you try. Hmm. Cool, man. Well, this has been a, this has been a very interesting, interesting conversation. Before we go, though, Mm-hmm. Give people a bit of a background on, uh, or just a heads up about where they can go to hear more about uh, Help Scout, or I need to go to uh, 
blog out there that you're on, if you're still doing that, where can people yeah. go to get all that? Uh, so go to helpscout.net. Uh, we also own .com, uh, but Help Scout, and uh, we, we have a great blog. We're launching a new blog uh, in the next month or so uh, that's going to talk about kind of growth and marketing strategies that we're using at Help Scout on a daily basis to kind of grow the business. But we've got a great blog that talks a lot about customer loyalty and so on and so forth. So, uh, and like I said, our mission is, is helping we create a company people love. And so if you're into that kind of content, uh, our blog is a great place to start. Fantastic. Well, uh, well, Nick, thanks for coming on the show. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, John. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening. If you want to discover more insider tips, tricks, and secrets about driving sales with email marketing, sign up for daily email tips from the autoresponder guy. Go to dropdeadcopy.com slash podcast, sign up, confirm your email address, and I'll send you daily emails on how to improve your email marketing and make more sales via email. You'll find out why open rates don't matter and the seven-letter word that underlies all effective marketing and much more.